This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. Please note that this podcast will have spoilers. In this chat, we will discuss the underlying themes, historical influences, inspirations, technology, ethical dilemmas, and other inspirational insights we have gleaned from each episode of the first season of Mr. Robot. We will be bringing on experts to share their insights and knowledge with us in each chat. We will also be reviewing each episode of the first season, as well as the second season season when it premieres. We are awake, we are free, we are alive for F Society IRC Podcast. Hello F Society IRC chat, this is your moderator Rosa Scheib with another review as I review episode 8, successor of the second season of Mr. Robot. So this episode is the first episode that did not have Elliot and it was a very unique episode I think. I really, really enjoyed it. I like it when television shows focus on either supporting cast members or exclusively, if you say, or perhaps, you know, ancillary characters and and build them out and give them an entire episode. And personally, I, I really enjoyed this episode. I think it gave us a lot of insight to the various motivations that brought a number of characters together, why they're doing the things that they're doing. It's also building off a lot of the tension that is happening. And most importantly, it answers some questions that that have been kind of, I want to say plaguing the show, but just kind of a little, a little drag, if you will, on, on a couple of the characters on, you know, their motivations and why they're there, what their purpose is as far as uh, either moving the plot forward or, are participating, you know, in F Society or Dark Army, or what is actually going on with the show. So we're going to do things a little bit differently. Um, we're going to talk about the F Society group. We're going to do Angela first, and then we're going to talk about F Society. And then when the split occurs between what happens, happens, uh, we'll focus primarily on the Mosby Trenton storyline with Dom thrown in there, and then clean up with the, the Darlene Cisco end of the F-Society storyline. So Angela is at this bar. She's with the gentleman that she had um, slept with in the beginning of the season. I guess they're still either seeing each other or just sleeping with each other. They're at a karaoke bar. She looks kind of miserable. I'm not quite sure when this t- is taking place. Oh, wait, it, it is taking place on July 4th, but as far as, like, it's obviously before, or maybe it was at, during the the meeting. It, she, she just seems very miserable. And she excuses herself from the guy, and she goes to the bar, and she ends up running into some, like, either neighbor or friend of her father's. His name is Steve, and he's, like, really critical of her and just, like, just shitting on her because she's working for E-Corp, and arrange for this that settlement and then Angela you know she just she kind of takes it and then she turns around and walks away and then she turns back and she comes back at Steve and says you're a plumber and all the 60 years in your existence that's the best you could do I'm 27 years old I have a six figure salary and I'm just getting started and she's like that's who I am and then she kind of walks away and she ends up meeting some, like, old dude at the bar. And I don't know if she's just, you know, she is intentionally trying to meet this guy because the the actor who plays the part of the, the, the man that she's talking to at the bar, uh, he's a well-known character actor. You don't just cast that person just because. So, obviously, he's somebody of some kind of significance or Angela wouldn't be talking to him at all. And they're having a conversation, they're talking, you know, there's a significant age difference and things like that. And Angela doesn't care. It's like, you know, hey, let's let's go. Let's do something. Oh, before that, she she had sung a karaoke song that kind of when the the F Society goose, as I want to start calling them, were trying to own Susan Jacobs. Uh, she was singing uh, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. And it was this kind of inner playing there, but after that, she finished that song. She goes. She goes to the bar. And we pretty much don't see any more of Angela, but we hear a lot about her later when we get into the Dom storyline. So on to F Society. 
So the episode itself uh, opens up with Ron's Coffee, our favorite coffee shop. And it's the first time that Mosey and Trin um, meet each other. It appears appear that they both know Darlene and both know Elliot, but they didn't know one another. And it's, you know, a very awkward uh, social interaction. Trin actually uses a little bit of social engineering to own Mosby's Android phone. Uh, Darlene kind of calls him on it because he kind of got owned there because they were doing a little game about whose phone, which phone is better, iPhone or Android. And Trin had basically set up a little uh, stage fright exploit on the on the website where it's supposed to mark the speed that basically allowed her access to Mosby's phone. Uh, it's very unique. It's, it, it's, a, it's a kind of little tongue-in-cheek there. Uh, Darlene is actually meeting in, in Elliot's stead, which I think was probably something that was commonplace, which makes, I think, Darlene, as far as group dynamics go, probably more attached to the group than Elliot is. In, in essence, she's probably more the leader of the group in the sense of a social setting sense, while Elliot might be the de facto leader. Like, he has the vision, he has the plan, he has his skill set. When it comes to kind of rallying the people, you know, this is a reason why she's the second command. I think Darlene kind of leads them a little bit better, perhaps in, maybe in the wrong direction. I think she does, in fact, lead them, and they trust her in this in this regard in her leadership abilities. So Darlene is, uh, they're at Ron's Coffee, and Darlene is reading basically the F Society motto, and it's basically the opening narration that, uh, Elliot has said about the 1% from, from last season. And there was a bit of a shout out to the Ron's Coffee on 14th, which was apparently something that was well known to have a very fast Wi-Fi where people are actually streaming 4K video. Uh, of course, that ended because, you know, Elliot had to scratch that scratch. I wonder if Ron's Coffee, that particular location, will come up again because even though it was seized by the FBI, it did have a T1 line, and I'm sure they took the servers and all that stuff, but I imagine the actual infrastructure of that location, all the components that allowed it to, to be a great Wi-Fi place, I bet you can probably just plug everything in back in, be a nice little plug-and-play. I'm, I'm pretty sure the FBI didn't yank the T1 line. They might still monitor it, but I wonder if it will, will come back into play in any, in any place that's maybe a secondary location for F Society. Or it could be another location for another business. Who knows? Which is my little speculation there. So we pretty much, once we get to the present, open up with where we where it ended with Darlene's in the F Society storyline from the previous episode in which... Darlene walked into the FCI headquarters and everyone, the three amigos, were huddled over the computer. And it turns out that there's a very important call that's happening on July 4th. It's a conference call. And they, because they own the FBI uh, phones, they have access to it. So they're able to actually go on to this conference call, enter the code, and listen in, which they did, and record the conversation. And it was the conversation a bit of a doozy. We'll talk about, you know, the inspiration of that towards the end of the episode. Uh, but they recorded the conversation. They're putting out a new F Society video. Darlene is the one that's actually behind the mask. And they, it gives a little insight on their setup. Triton's running the camera. They record everything on VHS. And then once they have successfully done, you know, the editing and stuff, they strip all the metadata uh, using, again, Kali Linux exploit programs and then upload it to Vimo. Uh, but an important thing was that the one of the tapes bust. Uh, the speech in itself just discussed, you know, the Universal Dec Declaration of Rights and privacy, privacy of being universal. It was another thing that uh, Darlene talked. Darlene like listed the names of a lot of the major corporations that are participating in Op Operation Berenstein. Um, one of the key data that they learned about Operation Berenstein was that three million people are being monitored since the five nine and a half illegally. Uh, second, that the FBI has backdoors in all the smartphone phones. And three, that they're focusing on 17 people for the F9 hack. And one of them is deceased. So that's that deceased part, that part of the call, is what's starting to fracture the, the group in and itself. Most, 
Mosby is, was already paranoid as it was because of Romero's death, but now it's amplified significantly. So they start arguing with one another. You know, the video is uploaded. Mosby wants to bail again, and he and Cisco get into it. And Mosby's like, "What? The Dark Army is gonna kill me?" And Cisco's pretty much explaining to him, "You know, yeah, that's that's pretty much what's gonna happen." And, and Mosby's like, wants to take his chances. He basically doesn't want to do this anymore. Darlene tries to reassure them, threaten, try to calm the group down, and and then she's trying to convey to the group that something has happened. And what has happened is that Susan Jacob has returned home. And so now there's another level, oh shit level, if you will. Uh, you know, they they tie up Susan Jacobs. Uh, they put her down in the basement area where there's the library and the pool. They were all pretty much freaking out. She's seen their faces. She knows their setup. Mosby wants to just cut and run. Trent's kind of, kind of with the deal. Uh, Darlene's like, no, we need to focus. Cisco's kind of backing up Darlene. She's not surprised with that. Susan Jacobs, of course, is screaming her head off trying to, you know, get someone to notice that she's been kidnapped. One of the funny things about it is that um, as they were tying her up, tying her up because she was a lawyer, she was like listing all the different types of crime, crimes that they just committed, and that if they let her go now, it would be one type of crime. But if they keep continuing, it's going to be this different type, you know, different type of felony, if you will. So Darlene tells Trent to go down and you know take care of Susan Jacobs. So Trent goes down there, and she's probably like one of the Socially speaking, meekest character. I imagine she's very, very good at, at coding. And Susan Jacobs convinces her to to let her go so she can go to the restroom. Of course, Trent does it, and then Susan Jacobs kind of lunges at her, and Trent was able to get out of the way. And she she ran smack in the wall, get, knocks herself out, and gets a nasty head wound. So now they have a kidnap E Corp lawyer hired high you know high level member of e corp they're in her home and now she has a nasty concussion or head wound and can possibly die on them so things go from bad to worse uh (laughs) cisco's like you know maybe we should cut our losses you know get her to the hospital because you know you most certainly don't want murder or i wouldn't say attempt to murder maybe manslaughter charges on them you know the fda her face is going to be blasted everywhere. Darlene was like, no, we need to own her. We need to blackmail her. And just was like, she's got it. She goes, tie her up. We're going through her stuff. So they go through all her computers, her cell phones, everything. Going through her emails, her hard drive, uh, accessing her information on the E-Corp servers, looking for any type of dirty, dirty, dirty laundry that they can use to blackmail Susan Jacobs. Uh they found one email they haven't been able to access it. Access. They're trying to figure out, you know, the best way, you know, by either going through her computers and partitioning stuff out, going through the Yahoo servers and trying to backwards brute force finding the passwords and uh, server name. Trenton, of course, goes to, to Susan Jacobs' office and comes back with a yellow sticky uh, with the missing email uh, name and password on it. So Darlene goes downstairs to the basement. Susan Jacobs is awake. She's like, you know, I'm not feeling really well. And Darlene's like, yeah, that's a nasty head wound. Offers Susan Jacobs some smokes, you know, unties her and everything. And they start talking. And she goes, you know, I'm coming, what's going to come down here and blackmail you? You know, you've been sleeping with these judges, I guess, in a way to get uh, favorable uh, rulings on her cases. But you're just going to slime your way out of the blackmail. And then she gets a little bit closer to Susan Jacobs and she goes, you know, I remember the first time I saw you. I was four years old and you were in the back behind the sea of suits. And it's, you know, this is the day of the, the, the court ruling, all the things that, you know, you kind of done with my family. And you laugh. It was so quick. No one noticed. And this whole time, Susan Jacobs is, you know, just trying to trying to get to Darlene, trying to talk her way out of it. But Darlene is not really budging. And she was like, you know, I'm taking down your company. I'm taking your home. And then she hits Susan Jacobs with a teaser in the heart. We'll get back to that in a second. And she falls into the pool. So, in essence, even though it shows that Darlene had kind of a little bit of freak out about it, she she killed Susan Jacobs. She wanted to kill Susan Jacobs. I think this was a plan all along. I think that's why she chose Susan Jacobs' home. Not just because it was a smart house, but because it was Susan Jacobs. But we'll get back to that towards the end of the episode, I can say. But she goes, Darlene goes upstairs and she lets, you know, the gang know. And this is when Moby just starts doing like a kind of a, you know, evil, crazy 
arm screwed type of a laugh. Uh, Trenton's in shock. Cisco shakes his head and she, she tries to say, you know, it was an accident. And Moby was like, she had a heart condition. It was in all the emails. Didn't you see it? And darling, she kind of like, I almost say she went like in a kind of very soft, almost little type of girl voice, but she, she said like, no. And the group doesn't believe her. She's obviously lying. They kind of know that she's lying. So she tells, you know, Moby and Trenton to, to leave. That Cisco and her are going to take care of the problem and wipe down the house. Moby's fine with this, even though he's a little pissed about it. Uh, this is what he wanted in the first place. So Trenton and Moby, they pick up their stuff. They go. Darling sits down at the, the table, opens Susan Jacobs' uh, email, and then sets up an automatic reply on their account, saying going on vacation from July 7th to July 27th. And that pretty much covers the little thing about Angela's meeting, which means this these this, these events are occurring at the same time as last episode's some of the last episodes, the tail end of last episode's events with, uh, you know, Elliot, you know, getting the letter at Angela attending that meeting. So what a way to weave stuff in, if you will, on the part of the show writers. So this is where the group splits. It splits between uh, Cisco and Darlene as a pair and Trenton and Moby as a pair. And so we're going to talk about the Trenton and Moby storyline first, and then we'll get back to the Darlene and Cisco storyline. So before we get into the Trenton and and Moby storyline, we have to touch on Dom a little bit because she does intertwine with their their story. When we first meet Dom for this episode, she is talking to that corporate douche dude from last season that Darlene had slept with and and took his gun out of his safe. And apparently uh, his gun was one of those smart guns where they do the little micro stamp on the back of every time time you fire a weapon in the back of the the casing. And that's why he was there. And this guy's pissed. He's like, I'm not part of that FD9 hack. Why would I want to crash the economy? That's how I make my money. And Dom was like, yeah, I I agree with you. You're, You're not part of the hack. But I have to ask these questions and go where the case is going. And, um, you know, we found this casing that's associated with this hack. And she's like, immunity's on the table, um, but we want a name. She's like, we're giving you immunity. Just give us a name. So the guy consults his uh, lawyer, and I'm thinking that he did, in fact, give Darlene his name. I'm not sure if he knows Darlene's name completely. He might, but this is just like one of those little little hiccups that I don't think factored in these little things that they have done these mistakes if you will that are are slowly piling up and they're going to attach themselves to a society so Trent and Moby are freaking out especially Trent she's in complete shock and Moby's like you need to get out of town I'm doing the same thing don't go back home and Trent's like "I, I can't do that I have my family and Moby's like you shouldn't have done this if you had so much to lose he goes what we've done it was just a fuck up we shouldn't have done this we've made the mistake and we cannot no longer pretend that this didn't happen so they they park their separate ways uh on the subway mosby he 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 eventually gets picked up the fbi but he, he tries to tries to evade them or tries to invade with either dark army or fbi that's what he told training is going to be meeting them at home he pays his pizza guy to, to go to his home take him a key that's under the mat and open and set the pizza in there and tell him there's anything weird going on. Uh, the pizza guy does it. Uh, Moby actually has cash, so it's probably why the guy did it for him. Uh, gives him 20 bucks. Uh, asks for now, the, uh, for the pizza that the guy has uh, on him as well. He says for another order. You know, he pays it, tries to get it. You know, uh, Moby goes home. He's like, packing up what stuff he has. And then he hears a noise and he looks out the window and there's all these like black cars. And then the knocks start happening. It's the FBI. They start knocking, knocking, knocking. At first, you think it might be dark on me, but they're knocking. They say they'll break down the door if he doesn't open. Um, we find out his name is Mr. Marrakesh. Uh, but he just stands there, and he's just petrified, and he's waiting for the FBI to come in. And and they do. They, they have, you know, a squad, if you will, a couple squads, probably squad as well, coming in and getting him. And they, he gets taken to, you know, the FBI headquarters. He's waiting there all night, and... Dom comes in to interrogate him. And he she was like, you know, Mr. Marrakesh, you know, sorry for the wait. You know, he's like, I've been here all night. She goes, I understand that. We just have a few questions for you. And they start talking about Leslie Romero. And she he doesn't really respond. She goes, 
Oh, hon, do you not know that your friend's been murdered? She knows he knows. Well, anyways, um, you know, I went to his mom's house, give my condolences, have a look around. And I found this, this flyer there, this flyer for DJ Moby in the World Party. And when I look at the Wayback Machine, there was an Angel Fire page from 2003, a fan page. And you're the only one that has a, a page for this very obscure DJ. He must really spoke to you. I know how that feels. You know, I, f- I have this passion for Romy, Romy and Michelle's high school reunion. I wonder if that's a weird little shout out for her because it's so specific. And she basically tells him, we don't want you. We want Tyrell Wellick, not Tyrell Wellick, DJ. So it would be your best judgment just to help us. And he looks at the flyer. He looks at her and says, lawyer. So he, you know, he's buttoned up. Uh, Santash, her boss, is uh, chewing her out. Uh, he's saying, you know, the OPR department with the, with the phone call, which basically revealed about the Operation Bernstein that was released by F Society. You know, department heads are getting, it's like three different department heads are getting fired. It's going to the Senate community. The, the, the FBI director is going to announce to the American public that this thing has been killed. And you've held a guy for 12 hours for no reasons. You know, he's like, the optic, optics on this is not going to look good. She's like, we need to start putting pressure on people. We need to start you know, basically kicking doors and taking names and getting these. And he's like, Sanchez is like, no, that's not what we should be doing. That's not how we can get this done. So I guess in a way, her, her boss has kind of shut her down. Moby gets released. Uh, he wicker messages uh, Trenton, which is a, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit towards the end. We talk about the tech stuff. Uh, it says, you know, they've been burned. He wipes his phone, puts it in a, a message basket that was near him. And then he he starts leaving, leaving, kind of making an exit to the first place that he he says we've been burnt. Meet me at the first place we met at noon that day. I guess we can start talking about Trenton. The same night that Moby was um, being picked by the FBI, there was some weirdness going on at Trenton's home. She's there with her parents. She's talking to them, saying, "Hey, you know, kind of hinting maybe we should move. Maybe we should get out of the city. It's kind of dangerous." And the father was like, no, no, we can't move. Uh, E-Corp is, uh, you know, frightening them on the deed. We might even lose the money that we invested in this place. It's, it's just, there's no more cheaper. There's not, nothing we can do. And it seems like she's very deeply concerned for her family. Uh, another observation about Trent is that she shares a room with a child. Um, so she's, you know, she's in a very small space. She's very attached to her family. She's going to meet with... Uh, Moby at the meeting because you got the wicker message. She's sitting there at the coffee house. Uh, she's there for about two hours and he hasn't shown. Now, the last time we saw Moby on the show was him going onto a subway and heading presumably to this meeting. So we have no idea what has happened to these two characters. Uh, she's she's kind of a bit frightened. She's been looking at the door every time somebody comes in. She she looks to see if, it, if it's him and it's not. And these guys are pretty much in the wind, if you will, MIA. Maybe they're off somewhere together. Uh, maybe Dark Army did pick them up. Maybe the FBI picked them up. So let's kind of finish this off with uh, Dom. Dom's at her workstation, or her workstation. She's talking to a fellow FBI agent, and it turns out the fellow FBI agent is the guy that's uh, dating or at least sleeping with Angela. And he's like, you know, she's cold. She just kind of ditched me for some old dude. She must be into old dudes. And Dom's like, you know, the hardest thing to do is get the insight into a woman. She and she's like, he, she never talked about F society. She never talked about the old days. And he's like, no, she's not anything. She's not giving anything up. And as they're talking, uh, Dom is looking at this, the videotape that F society had released. They're going by frame by frame by frame on the screen to try to get any bits of information from it. And even the the, the, the FBI agent that's uh, sleeping with Angela, he's like, you know, this this thing that's in the news, man. It's and some paranoid stuff. It's some kind of Snowden next level type of a deal. I just I just want to highlight just kind of how cold blooded a little bit Dom is because she obviously sent this agent to basically be a spy on her, of course, uh, tracking Angela down. But I didn't realize that the the level of the things that agents can do, like sleeping with the, somebody or something like that, and that's acceptable practice. Then again, she is part of Operation Berenstein, so. 
she's obviously going to great lengths to track uh, F society down these hackers, whether it's the or lawful, she, she's going to get her man. So let's finish this episode out. Going back to the Bonnie and Clyde of our group grouping here of Cisco and Darlene. Uh, they're, they're down in the basement. They're staring at the body. Cisco refers to the body as it. Darlene refuses to as she and Susan Jacobs and does it throughout the time of their dialogue. And Cisco is like, you know, maybe we should cut our losses and and get out of here, take our chances. Darlene is like, no, we need to finish this off. He's like, maybe we can just leave it here. And she goes, the the other group, the group that she sent to uh, DC to do the to do the activities down there, um, the bull drop, and then that the house community that we saw on the day of the bailout voting would come. And he goes, well, we'll just text them and say it's brunch. He goes, we can't take the chance that they um, were going to come. We need to do full wipe down mode. Like we do every time after every hack. And he goes, well, if you're suggesting some like acid, or ch- chainsaws or whatever, that like that, then I'm not going to oblige. She goes, this is not a conversation. He goes, you know, screw this. Let me call my boys. She's like, no, I don't trust them. Obviously, his boys are dark army. We're going to do this. And they do. They somehow bundle Susan Jacobs into a suitcase and they take it to our favorite veterinarian. Um, he's a little upset with Darlene because, of course, they did release those dogs. He said he almost got fired, and because of all that, they have to pay double. And Cisco's like, oh, we don't have double. We barely have any cash. And Darlene was like, fine. What about eCoin? And he, he, he kind of stares at her, just give me your phone. He taps her phone, and he transfers 2,000 eCoin to her. He's fine with this. He looks at the bag. He goes, what are you guys doing? She goes, I pay you for some privacy. So he leaves take the bag they go to the furnace try to get the bag into the furnace but it doesn't fit uh so they have to take her body out (laughs) and they're not completely thrilled with it but they do they they put her body in and they they light everything we're going to talk a little bit about the e-coin thing a little bit because even cisco kind of side-eyed her uh she says it's from susan jacobs cold storage she's paying for her own funeral we'll talk about it towards the end so they're riding back in the subway, and, and Darlene's a little bit in shock. She's a little freaked out, and Cisco's trying to reassure her, and she goes, I didn't know I was capable of doing that. You know, I always thought that there would be something that would stop me, and, and nothing did. So it was very clear that Darlene had planned this. She wanted to kill Susan Jacobs. I mean, she told her that story about, you know, when she was four years old, seeing her laughing at the the court ruling, you know, all the things that E Corp had put her family through, which makes me wonder what type of lawsuit is happening. Was this a death suit? Or was her was her father a whistleblower? What was going on? She's in this for vengeance is just as much as Elliot is. She she exacted her play on the flesh, if you will, from Susan Jacob. So Cisco says, you know, come to my place, you crash there, you shouldn't be alone. She does that and um, you know, Darlene wakes up, it's like the next morning Cisco's taking a shower. She talks to him a little bit. He's like, you know, I just got there. He just woke up. And, you know, Darlene being Darlene, maybe it's an Alderson thing or a hacker thing, gets on his computer. And she finds out that he's not only talking to Dark Army, but he has a web camera on her, letting him know her location. And that there's something about stage two that's about to launch. The same stage two that White Rose talk to her assistant about apparently Cisco knows a little bit about it so Cisco gets out of the shower Darlene is on one side of the wall and this is where she uses a bit of a social engineering skill he he looks at her and is like what and then she put the places her eyes down she looks down and he looks down and he sees that she smashed his computer and because his back was turned to turned to her he doesn't see the baseball bat that about smacked him upside the head and that is the end of the the episode there. I, who knows if Cisco's still alive? Uh, I think he is, and whether or not he stays alive. But it's very clear that Darlene has no hesitation to not only use violence, but she doesn't trust the Dark Army. She wants to know what stage two is. She doesn't like being played, and she is going to come after Cisco or come after Dark Army or, or do something. Um, some things to notice about uh, again, I do think that Darlene had 
planned to murder Susie Jacobs. That was her end game, uh, taking over the home. All that wasn't because of a smart house. It was because of Susan Jacobs. Uh, the fact that they were tracking her, and you can see when Susie Jacobs does come to the house, there's a big TV that has her tracking location on, and no one was really paying attention. I think that was kind of intentional that, you know, Darlene was kind of distracting them a, a bit about this. Uh, another interesting thing was, like, in Cisco's apartment, he has a tiger mask on his wall. Uh, we've seen kind of, I want to say dragon mask. I'm not sure what type of mask the Dark Army, what their representation is. Uh, but the red masks are different. Maybe they, there's different masks for different levels or Dark Army operatives. Like I said, Trenton shares a room with a baby. I don't know if that's her child or not, or if it's uh, another family member's child, or maybe it's a younger sibling. But obviously, she's in a very small, tight space, very close to her family, very concerned. That's why she's doing this. That's what she's motivated by. Just like she told Darlene last season, she wants to free the debt that her, her parents have. But that's not what happened if they don't own their home, if they they don't have any money. Um, another interesting thing is that eCoin is everywhere. I know with Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin, you don't have to have like an X amount of money to to be associated with Bitcoin, to purchase Bitcoin, if you will. You don't have to have your government affiliation or address or anything like that with like opening a bank account with Bitcoin. But you are capable of tracking transactions across the blockchain. And there's all these different, they're called chain analysis. They're able to track people's IP addresses, uh, where the coin goes, when it goes to one location, where it splits off, even identifying one location, for example, if it's like, an exchange like Coinbase, and then it goes to like a, a vapor store, and then from the vapor store it goes to this account, and then it goes from that account, and maybe it goes into BitPay, and then gets transaction out, and then it goes back on exchange, and you can follow coins back and forth all day long. And I'm a little concerned on whether or not that same methodology can be used on eCoin, and it can be traced back that it was Susan Jacobs coins. Uh, it went to that guy, and he's going to get tagged. Another thing was that Cisco has a tattoo, uh, a Chinese symbol, which seems to be something that all the Dark Army operators have. Leon had a tattoo, so Cisco has a tattoo. Uh, there was a few other Dark Army operatives that we've seen with their tattoos. Uh, the type of hacking that was going on was, um, from all the little posts that I've seen, is very on par. Like, you know, going into the Yahoo servers and looking for for an exploit there to to find the, the email address for Susan Jacobs is a known one. The stripping of the metadata, which is very important. Um, most people don't realize that when they use digital devices, it, you know, it could put in your location, time, date, the use of the device, what type of SIM card, all this little information can be tagged into the, to the video and you're, you can be completely unaware of it. It's not even just even the stuff that you personally might add to for your own personal references, these things are naturally occur. And for them to strip all that, it really makes things um, a little bit easier to obfuscate uh, FSA societies, you can say, their identities. The phone call conference, the phone co conference call that the F society recorded that the, is actually based on a real event. The Lutz guys that were part of Anonymous did the same thing to the FBI. So this is something that has happened before in the real world has now been incorporated into Mr. Robot. I think, well, some people considered Elliot's absence noticeable. I thought it was very acceptable because, again, I think, like I said, I like it when they, they focus on secondary characters in a television show. I think it's necessary to build those characters out, to flush them out and attach them to the storyline better. Like, they do have uh, value. They have purpose that beyond just being like the sidekick to the main character not sure exactly what stage two is what why what what white rose is up to but be interesting to see when that revelation comes out what is the purpose but other than that it was another excellent episode for mr robot i'm looking forward to the, the rest of the episodes that are going to come out we're almost to the end here so we're gonna we're gonna start getting all the nothing but big reveals big reveals big reveals Clearly, Tyrell Wellick, I, I hope he's still alive because they've been building him up to be the fall guy, and you can't have a fall guy if he's dead. You just can't. So in those three days, I'm wondering if maybe Dark Army snatched Tyrell Wellick from Elliot. Maybe uh, Evil Corp snatched 
Tyra Wellick, maybe Mr. Robot stashed Tyra Wellick somewhere. But I think he's still alive because, again, he has to play the, the role of the Patsy. And Patsy's need to be alive, even for a brief few moments in the sun for everyone to see before, you, you know, someone gets rid of them. So that's it for this chat. I'm logging off now. Until next time. Thank you for joining us on this chat. You can find us on all podcast outlets such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, MixCloud, and any podcast capture. You can reach us on Twitter at FSocietyIRC, our website at FSocietyIRC.xyz. You can email us at FSocietyIRC at ProtonMail.com. Our music attributes are under the Creative Commons license number three. The intro music is by Monk. The song is called The Planet Shakers, The Paragraph Remix. Our outro music is by Trevet Halbeka, and the song is Zelta Kappa, as well as Kwana, and the song is Demons. You can support the show either via the QR code in the show notes by contributing with a Bitcoin or through PayPal, and there's a link in the show notes where you can PayPal me under Horosia Shai. If you're very into uh, cryptocurrency, you can also tip me through a uh, chain chip at Horosia or at one name at Hiroshima. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to hearing from you. Logging off. This has been a Hiroshima Shad Space Odyssey Network production.